Welcome to the Circuit Python Show. I'm your host, Paul Cutler. This episode, I'm joined by Joshua Lowe. Joshua is a Python entrepreneur who invented Edublocks to help bridge the gap from scratch to Edublocks and then into Python 3. Joshua started learning Python in 2013 and wanted to find a way to make it easier for others to understand. Josh, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Tell me about Edublocks. So Edublocks was a project that I started about six years ago now. It all surrounded this idea of, you know, I've always been interested in like computers and technology from a very young age. You know, being the age I am 18, I've always been surrounded by, um, you know, technology. And we were talking um, a few days ago about you not having an internet for a few days. I, I can't imagine life without the internet or, you know, technology, just because I've always been surrounded by it. I've always been interested in technology. And it was around the time the Raspberry Pi came out which was 2012 now, 10 years ago, which seems like a crazy, crazy thing to me. Um, yeah, when the Raspberry Pi came out, it kind of stemmed this interest into the coding and programming side of technology. You know, I'd always been curious about messing around with laptops and stuff, but I never really had any exposure to being able to code, being able to program, and messing about with hardware, that kind of stuff. And yeah, so in 2012, the Raspberry Pi came out, and about a year later... I uh, joined the Raspberry Jam event. So Raspberry Jam is all across the world now. I'm sure most people know what they are. Uh, but they're like coding meetups for people interested in the Raspberry Pi or, you know, other related things like CircuitPython, Micbit, those kind of things. And yeah, I went along to this event and, you know, I was really interested in, you know, the coding side of things. And I started learning off Scratch. So learning Scratch, the drag and drop programming language. And yeah, building lots of different projects with Scratch. And, you know, that's something that I really enjoyed for a few years uh, and all the different things you can do with it. You know, even programming stuff with the Raspberry Pi, um, like GPIO, that kind of stuff. But then after I'd learned Scratch for a few years and, you know, done lots of projects with that, I kind of realized that, you know, if I wanted to do this as a career, which I was kind of set on at that point of, you know, this is something that I'd like to do in the future, that I'd have to learn a text-based programming language. And kind of like the, the main one that you go to after Scratch, or at least in the UK anyway, I'm not sure how it is in other countries, especially in schools, you go from Scratch and then you go to Python. So yeah, I was kind of making this transition from, you know, I've done Scratch for a few years. I was kind of used to how all the visual stuff worked. And now I have to make this jump to Python and, you know, the text-based programming side of things. And like a lot of people who have picked up Python from nothing or, you know, made the transition from block-based, text-based using Python. It was kind of a big jump between the two because, you know, suddenly you're having this environment of a drag-and-drop block-based environment where, you know, it's very visual. It helps you along the way. You can't really get any errors of that kind of stuff. Uh, to Python where if you make the littlest mistake of, you know, a missing capital letter, punctuation, indentation, that kind of stuff, you know, you can get a red wall of text that, you know, to a beginner means absolutely nothing. So I kind of wanted to create something that would bridge the gap between the two of, oh, well, you know, bring this block-based environment back, but also, you know, have a text element to it of, oh, well, why don't we put the text on the blocks that you drag and drop in lines of code? So Edgebox kind of started as a platform where you could build stuff with the Raspberry Pi. So one of the early examples was Minecraft Pi. So you could interact with Minecraft on the Raspberry Pi and build projects with that. Oh, neat. Yeah, so that was a really kind of popular thing to, to kick off. And later down the line, there was projects with GPIO pins and electronics. So that was kind of like the early start of Edgebox. And then from there, it extended to the mic bit, then CircuitPython, and then Python on the web. So that's kind of like how it started. Wow, that's a heck of a story. What inspired you to make Edublocks open source from the beginning? It was through going to events like the Raspberry Jams and later PyCons and uh, conferences like that. You know, I got to meet a lot of people in the open source community and kind of learn how GitHub works and the benefits that making a project open source can bring. A lot of the success of Edublox is kind of down to making it open source. I didn't really fully understand the impact of it at the time because, you know, I'd seen like these big projects from like Microsoft and companies like that who would open source things like, well, not at the time, but MakeCode is an example of an, an open source project. You know, I'd seen that they got a lot of contributions from community members 
to make the project better. I never really thought that would happen to Edgebox or, you know, making it open source, you know, would bring that kind of impact. But there was a big community around it that would submit issues, submit pull requests and, you know, really dedicate to a project because, you know, they saw an idea and they, you know, they believed in it and they wanted to, you know, help out. So, yeah, it's been really helpful to make it open source and, you know, kind of that community aspect of it is, you know, really important to the project and a lot of the work that I do. And, you know, being able to give back to the community and, you know, kind of have that community spirit around it. So that was kind of the main reason. That's awesome to hear. So tell me a little bit more about Edublox. Edublox has different modes and some of those modes can work with hardware. How does that work? Edublox started off as a tool for the Raspberry Pi. You could do basic stuff like the GPI opens, uh, some projects with using them, and also Minecraft Pi. Uh, so they were kind of the two things at the start. And then it slowly extended into doing more basic things with Python. So, you know, print hello world, that kind of stuff. And then later Python turtle. Yeah, that was kind of like the, the first mode, if you will. And then from there, uh, the kind of whole Edublox tool gained in popularity and people wanted more things like port for the mic bit was next. So being able to build projects with the mic bit, scroll and stuff on the display. Same thing with the Raspberry Pi, being able to plug stuff into the pins on the mic bit uh, to build like physical competing projects. And then the next one after that was actually CircuitPython. And that came about through meeting Scott and Katney and Dan from the CircuitPython team at PyCon in 2018, I think it was. Hopefully I got that right. So yeah, PyCon 2018, I kind of met them and I'd heard of CircuitPython before. I never really had any exposure to it. So I hadn't really played around with the Circuit Playground and the other Circuit Python boards. And, you know, after playing around with them at PyCon, I was like, yeah, I think this is the next kind of mode that I want to go for. So, you know, I introduced very similar things, being able to build physical computer projects, interact with the, the speaker and the near pixels on the Circuit Playground. So the modes are kind of like different sections of hardware that you can use. And then also alongside that, there's like a, a Python mode, which is, you know, this basic Python, which you can run in the browser. And more recently, which isn't Python, HTML, so you can build websites and stuff like that. But it is mainly dedicated to, to Python because of the range of hardware that supports it. And also Python just being, you know, the, the main text-based programming language that's used in schools uh, here in the UK. And it, it is mainly a program for schools, but, you know, there are lots of home users that use it as well. Enthusiasts who, you know, just want to learn how to code on their own. Um, so it's... a really wide range of uh, users and that's kind of like how the modes integrate with it. Out of all of those users over the years, have you seen one or two projects that really stand out in your mind? Things that people have done with Edublox that maybe you didn't expect? I think probably instead of projects, I would probably say that the, the standout thing for me is, you know, being able to see people who were kind of put off by that transition from Scratch to Python and then going back and using Edublox and being able to you know, pick up, um, you know, text-based programming language. I think the, the, that that's kind of like the standout thing for me, if I can think of one thing in particular, because, you know, I, I've i always wanted to be able to pass on my knowledge and love for, for coding and computer science, all those kind of things uh, to other people. But especially the problem that I was seeing in UK schools, at least, was people were being put off by the idea of coding and programming because, you know, they saw this, horrible red line of text when they were learning text-based programming and you know they'd had all this visual element of it taken away from scratch uh, when they were learning python so being able to provide something that helps people to kind of follow a similar path to me and be able to share you know the love that i have for it i think that's really kind of like the lesson legacy of it that i see and you know the, the kind of uh, big standout thing you know that i can think of where do you see edublox going next it's a difficult question because it, it changes it changes all the time. I kind of like what I want to do next with it. Yeah, I think obviously, you know, expanding the feature set. So uh, one of the big things that I'm working on at the minute is tutorials and examples. So, you know, I really want anyone to be able to load up Edgebox and, you know, kind of have this uh, guided tutorial experience where, you know, they can learn themselves and have like a, a self-guided learning experience. So that's kind of the main thing that I'm working on, lots of content and, and lessons and that kind of thing. 
so yeah, expanding the tutorial set and also, you know, I've got some different mode ideas that I want to kind of work on. Um, you know, last year I introduced the ability to have extensions in the mic bit mode. So being able to type in a GitHub URL and very similar to how make code works and extend the capabilities of uh, the mic bit mode to do, to support different mic bit libraries. Alongside the tutorials, the other thing that I want to do in the next release that I do is expand the extension capability to the circuit Python mode and the Python mode. So you're able to use third party libraries um, uh, with those modes, which will be uh, pretty exciting to see what that opens up. We've been talking a lot about education. You graduated high school in 2020, just as the pandemic was starting to hit. What role do you think remote learning can play in education going forward? I think the pandemic has kind of brought forward the use of lots of technology in the classroom um, you know, forward. And I think we're always going to see the shift to, you know, using tools like Google Classroom, uh, Microsoft Teams and things like that uh, to be able to um, provide education to a wider range of people. But yeah, through the pandemic, you know, all of a sudden people were forced to, you know, kind of learn from home and, you know, use all these new tools. And I think, you know, the use of things like Google Classroom probably has, you know, kind of died off a bit as people move back to the classroom. But I think things like that are, are always going to have a place now, you know, where other subjects, you know, when I was in my last year of high school, um, you know, we used Google Classroom for all of our classwork, all of our homework. And, you know, it was just a normal thing in that subject. But, you know, I think things are going to move across all the subjects where you know, we kind of embrace technology and you know technology is used a- across school and i think also the pandemic's highlighted the need for wider a- access to internet and uh, you know we just take for granted uh, that everyone has an internet connection but you know the pandemic's kind of made us realize that you know technology is not accessible to everyone um and you know the things that that we enjoy um you know not everyone can access so i think over the next few years we're probably going to see a push to you know, make internet, which at this point is, you know, kind of something that's fundamental to, you know, modern day life, but we just take it for granted. So I think we are going to see a big push, you know, for making the internet more accessible for everyone and also bringing more opportunities to people who might not have had them before. And, you know, things that we're really interested in, like building things with circuit Python devices or learn how to code, you know, these things are going to be uh, really big over the next few years, I think, uh, you know, where more jobs are involved in technology and, you know, there's a, a greater need for people in software engineering and computing in general. Um, I think there was a statistic that I learned at an event that I went to the other year where 60% of jobs that will exist in, I think, 10 years it was, or uh, the age group that were there, 60% of jobs that this age group are going to, you know, go for in the future you know, don't exist yet because they're all related to future technologies and um, augmented reality, um, artificial intelligence, that kind of stuff. I think there is a, a real need to kind of push this whole switch to virtual learning and being able to make sure coding is accessible for everyone. I think the pandemic's really highlighted that, you know, everyone needs equal opportunities to be able to, to access these things. I absolutely agree. Well, we're almost out of time, but before we go, I have one last question i like to ask all of my guests. You're about to start a new project. Which microcontroller do you reach for? Uh, so this is probably quite an easy one for me. So it has to be the Microbit, specifically the Microbit V2 that came out um, over a year ago now, actually, which is pretty hard to believe. So, And the thing I really like about the Microbit is, you know, it's a really cheap device, um, £13 in the UK, if I've got that right. But it's got lots of capabilities as well. So you've got Bluetooth, uh, you've got a, a display where you can scroll messages. So that's a you know really fun beginner project. But you've also got the pins at the bottom where you can plug into lots of different add-on boards um, to be able to extend the capabilities. Um, and yeah, I think I think the mic bit and the features that the V2 brought, like the better processor, um, you know, the, the onboard speaker, and the, the touch logo, which is pretty cool. I think it's a really good beginner's board. But also it provides, you know, the capability to be extended and to do lots of different advanced projects as well. So there's no kind of like limit with it. I think that's what I really like about the mic bit. I think whilst the mic bit is a really good general board, uh, there's so many like other boards that I really like 
like the circuit playground express is one that i've really liked to use before um, and some of the smaller trinket boards whilst the micro bits kind of like my favorite all-around board there's lots of others that i really enjoy using as well that's a great pick if people want to learn more about edublox or you where should they go uh, the best place is edublox.org you can find all the social links on there and also all the the guides and resources to get started and places to contact me if you've got any questions or you've got any queries or need any help with the project if you want to start using it uh, so that's probably the best place to go Josh, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the CircuitPython show. For show notes, transcripts, and to support the show, visit circuitpythonshow.com. Until next episode, stay positive.